My name is Eric Gordon, and uh, I'm an associate professor at Emerson College, actually, in the Department of Visual Media Arts, and I run a, I run a lab there called the Engagement Lab. And what's interesting is that I'm the one who's uh, moderating this, this panel on, on big data, and, and I'm, I'm really a small data guy. Uh, and, and I think that maybe is why I was asked to moderate this panel, because uh, uh, perhaps um, the, the perspective that, that, um, that maybe I can bring to this is, is, is thinking about that, that small data, thinking about that, um, that kind of qualitative and uh, experiential component to data. So I just want to say a few words before I introduce our, our really uh, our, our fantastic panel. Um, which is the, the big question that is posed to our panel today is how to understand the entirety of the ecosystem of data in Boston. That is uh, no small task. And what's so interesting about the way that this is framed is that it is framed in terms of, a, of an ecosystem. And it got me thinking about, about what, that, what that means, actually, to think about. Uh, it's not just about bigger and better data, but it's about the entirety of the ecosystem. So how does data fit? Into the, into the context of governance and civic life, I think is at the core of that question. Um, and that, again, is no easy question, especially when we consider the length of the data life cycle and the multiple actors involved in each stage of that life cycle. So if we think about it this way, if the life cycle of data is, is making it, collecting it, cleaning it, analyzing it, using it, then data-driven decisions are simply one part in a much larger whole. So each stage of this life cycle is crowded with human and non-human actors, including community groups, organizations, social media tools, analysts, politicians, et cetera, each with its own political, social, and <coughs> cultural motivation. So while the focus of the data community has been historically on opening up access, and rightly so, it's a huge problem. This panel is testament to the fact that the conversation is starting to broaden. What we're now thinking about is a metaphor of an ecosystem, and we can address questions of power, so when data appears complete, it appears to be true. We can address questions of control, who owns data and who has access, and we can address questions of influence, data-driven versus data-informed that correspond with every stage of the data life cycle. So I want to now just turn to, to the panel. And the way that we're going to we're, we're run the conversation uh, this afternoon is like uh, in previous panels, where each of the panelists is going to speak for, for five to seven minutes. Um, they're going to explain their own, uh, their own take on, on these issues, all these issues and their particular role in it. Um, and then when they're done, I'll facilitate them in a dialogue, um, just, uh, just the four of us first, and then we'll open it up. Uh, we encourage you to, um, to uh, ask questions on Twitter so that we can record your data and use it later. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, we'll, and then we're, gonna, we're gonna open up the conversation, and we'll have time at the end to open up to, to in-person uh, questions as well. So let me go ahead and, and introduce my panel, uh, starting here with Yasha Franklin Hodge, um, who's the Chief Information Officer of the City of Boston. Um, his, his, uh, he, he needs no other introduction, I think. Uh, his his uh, full bio is, is, um, is, is in the program, and you can read it there. Uh, I also want to, his uh, left is Jessica Martin, and she's the research manager at the Boston Indicators Project at the Boston Foundation. Um, and then uh, to her left is Dan O'Brien. Uh, Dan O'Brien is a research director of uh, BARI, the Boston Area Research Initiative, and also an assistant professor of public policy and urban affairs and criminology. Whew. Um, and, uh, oh, oh, sorry, and criminal justice. It, it's a lot of hats. <laughs> really? That's amazing. Uh, at Northeastern University. So, um, so let's, uh, let's get started with uh, Yasha here. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, uh, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's always an interesting challenge being the uh, first speaker after lunch. Uh, you know, you, know, you got to keep it interesting and make, uh, make sure people can uh, stay awake. So hopefully we'll keep this, uh, we'll keep this fun here. Um, so to start off, I would like to set the stage for some of the things that we're doing in the city right now around data, how we're trying to bring data into the operation and management of uh, City Hall on a, on a daily basis. Um, there was a, let's see if I can get the, 
clicker to work, there we go. Uh, so there's an article that ran in the Globe a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, was headlined, uh, Walsh Ties Goals to Fast Flow of Data. Uh, and it detailed some of the uh, vision that the mayor has set out for the city of Boston and the ways in which he's looking to use data to actually achieve that vision. Uh, some of the quotes from that article and from subsequent uh, uh, speeches and, and, and conversations he's had on this topic, the vision was of a Boston that was thriving, innovative, and healthy. And within each of those areas, uh, the mayor laid out a set of objectives around education, public safety, the environment, the economy, uh, health, uh, uh, government operations, you know, a series of, 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 uh, of goals within uh, this broader uh, uh, concept of a, of a thriving and innovative and healthy city. Um, but what was interesting about the development of that vision and the way we, we sought to articulate it was to both be aspirational and inspirational as well as data-driven, as well as focused on what success would actually look like in numbers. Uh, the, the goal for us, as we thought about vision, wasn't to say, you know, just how do, we, how, do we set a, how do we set a tone or how do we set an idea, but also to ask, are, you know, how do we know if we're making progress? How are we holding ourselves accountable? How do we know if we're actually having an impact for the city of Boston? Uh, and really, that was the core of this, is the idea that data belongs in the process of creating and articulating a vision, not because you know, it's a good buzzword, but because that's the core to actually ha measuring whether that vision works, whether that vision means anything. Um, so to talk about this in a more specific way, uh, I want to take one of these elements of the, the mayoral vision that he set out, which was uh, around housing. There were, there were nine uh, uh, key elements that he talked about. But uh, the idea that the mayor put forth was that we should be a city where housing is affordable, accessible, and safe for all residents. Uh, so our challenge was to say, OK, how, how do we know if we're doing that? Um, there are programs that are designed to advance this agenda. There are uh, departments whose focus is around housing and development within the city and, and channeling that in great directions, making sure that we're working towards uh, this kind of an aspirational goal. So we set about identifying the uh, top level goals, the numbers that would indicate whether we're making progress towards that uh, aspirational objective. So we looked at how many tens of thousands of new units of housing we would need to build, uh, what it would mean for where our student population is housed in the city of Boston, uh, looking at uh, things like uh, the way in which idle uh, city-owned land might be put to use to support our housing goals. And so we created a set of, of top-line goals that have programs attached to them. And from there, sought to find measures that could help us uh, really track our progress day-to-day week to week, month to month, towards those top line goals. So we looked at things like the number of units we permitted, the vacancy rate, uh, the number of parcels we disposed of, where the students are living. There's a variety of measures. This is only a, a sample of this. But this is our way of trying to bring that culture of uh, accountability to the idea of an aspirational vision. And there's a few things here. Accountability is one, and, and I talked a little bit about this. But this also recognizes that the challenges that we face, and to really achieve any, any progress for a city, we can't just think in the traditional narrow silos of government. A big part of the challenge that is before us is about how we break through those barriers. Housing just isn't, isn't just a problem for the Boston Redevelopment Authority and, or the Department of Neighborhood Development. It's for both those departments. The Transportation Department plays a role. There are departments throughout the city that are involved in helping us achieve this vision. And by taking measures that look at things from homelessness to student housing to construction, we're able to start a conversation that spans across those uh, different departments in those different areas. So the other piece of this is the cultural piece. And this is, of course, a, a quote that hopefully many of you are, have, have seen before. Uh, the mayor is trying to bring a culture of data-driven management into the operation of his administration. He has dashboards in his office that he looks at uh, on a daily basis, and you know, people who work in the city know that he looks at them, because he'll sometimes call them up and ask about something he's seeing on there, or uh, something that caught his attention and, and, and has him concerned. Uh, so you see this at the mayoral level 
and it helps to drive, you know, just from the top line, an awareness of data and a engagement around uh, the types of measures that people know the mayor is going to be looking at. But we're trying to bring that down to the next level of the cabinet, the leadership. This is from last Friday's cabinet meeting, which was solely focused around data. And the meeting was spent reviewing different measures, different initiatives, and tracking our progress. What, are, what is the data showing us about our progress towards these initiatives? You're starting to see that cross-departmental discussion and collaboration come into play around data in a way that it did not exist before. And we're trying to bring this down to the managers. You know, when the mayor calls and says, hey, why is it taking, a, why are we not meeting our service agreement level agreements on, on fixing broken streetlights? You need to, you need to, the manager needs to be able to answer that question. So we're building data tools that allow managers to drill down. All of these are part of the same stack of data. So they're driven by the same, from the same sources and, from, and, and using the same tools so that when the mayor asks a question that the, the managers have the, the, the same kinds of information but at a more detailed level and with the ability to, to really dig into it to answer questions. Um, so the, uh, the, we're doing this at an individual accountability level as well, really measuring, in this case, inspector performance to try to get to uh, uh, clarity on, on where we have performance challenges for, for particular individuals. Uh, the last thought I want to leave you with, this is a slide that I borrowed from the uh, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics in New York City, MODA. Um, there's a lot of plumbing that goes into this. This is their data uh, architecture slide. So in addition to these uh, programs that we're trying to build and these uh, connections we're trying to make, we're also trying to build the plumbing for the city of Boston to connect all of the different source systems, all of the different uh, sources of data, the different departments, uh, some of whom are very happy to share, some of whom uh, need a little bit more prodding, and bring it into an environment where we can do analysis, where we can do reporting, where we can do visualization, uh, with that holistic picture, looking across departments, looking at factors that connect with each other. So, uh, last thing, some of the challenges and opportunities that we see, uh, we are uh, looking at how we can better utilize some of the existing indicators that are out there that are well-researched and well-developed. Uh, how do we tap into the research expertise, much of it in this room, that uh, can help us design better measures? Looking at our role both as a consumer of data from, uh, from our partners, but also as a publisher. How do we serve the research community and the business community effectively? And lastly, thinking about the, the speed differential. Um, the research world often operates on a cycle of months and years, and the city is often thinking in hours and days. Uh, how do we connect the dots and make sure that we're all being helpful to each other? Uh, so I'm over time. I will end it there uh, and hand it over to Jessica. Great. Well, I think we have our definition of the data ecosystem, and I can just leave. <laughs> no. um, I uh, don't have some slides today, no visual apparatus for my discussion, but um, I think that what Yasha teed up really uh, speaks to quite a bit of the work that we've done in the Indicators Project over time. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what the Boston Indicators Project is and uh, how this evolved within Boston's data ecosystem in, a, in an analog age um, a few years ago and how it's evolved into the digital age. So um, I think that we're talking about data and there's a really big difference between data and indicators. Um, data are lots of random bits of information that you can aggregate and, and create and, and measure any anything really, whether it's the steps we take or the number of hours we sleep or what have you. Um, but it doesn't really tell us much about where we're going and where we want to be. And that was really what the Boston Indicators Project was about when it was first idealized or conceived of back in 1997 um, as a partnership uh, and conversations between the city of Boston and the Boston Foundation and ultimately inclusive of a very large number of partners. Um, but at the time, there already was a really robust data ecosystem in Boston. Um, many people in the room today, uh, academic institutes, think tanks, city departments, were producing and thinking about data um, and research. There was something called the Boston Children and Families Database that um, put all sorts of administrative data into and unified them at the family and child unit level unit of analysis uh, that people were using. And the indicators project was less, while well, data is at the core of what we do, um, our mission has been kind of a three prong of uh, tracking progress on civic goals, uh, democratizing access to data and information, and fostering informed public discourse. And I think that gets to, to the whole point of it, which was to, to what end? 
data should not just exist, but it needs to serve a purpose and tell us where we're going. So it took about three years from 1997 until 2000 to develop a framework of uh, vision statements for Boston and the region in the year 2030. Um, it was a, a very inclusive of, of the city and the foundation, but also um, broadening out to about 300 people from a cross-section of civic life to cr come up with some narrative, um, but ultimately measurable goals for where we want to be at the 400th anniversary. Um, and so over time, with our partners at the city and, and data providers, um, as well as a really strong partnership that we've had for the last 15 years with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, continued over time to track our progress um, with data across 10 different sectors ranging from civic vitality to arts, education, transportation, uh, make that data available to people in a very consumable level. Um, I would say that our, our primary audience isn't necessarily a technologist or a data scientist, but a resident or a nonprofit organization that's looking, or a journalist or policymaker who just wants to really understand what does this all mean and, and why should it matter to me. Uh, we have um, evolved into the digital age from the analog age by moving. The first report we released in 2000 was about 300 pages long um, with great charts and graphs and really succinct, but uh, now we have evolved to um, shorter reports, more web, making our data available on the website, um, building out something called the Metro Boston Data Common as a data repository with uh, MAPC. Um, but ultimately, it, it's about the goals and, and how are we doing. And so um, right now, uh, the goal, we started in 2000, uh, and we have a goal year of 2030, and so we're coming up on 2015, which is the halfway point, which is why it's really exciting right now to be in this room with kind of the ecosystem 2.0. Um, who are the new players? We have a really robust crop of civic technologists and data scientists who can do things that really now we couldn't even do two years ago, five years ago, um, in terms of gaining insights from big data and city administrative data sets. We have new academic um, methods and approaches to really creating knowledge from all of this data and information in a practical way. And so I think that with the Boston Indicators Project, We've, we've kind of wanted over time to be a repository and a place to amplify all of that, um, and, but really keep it focused on what does this mean to the, a broader community and how can this inform strategies and solutions to some of these persistent problems that we've seen over 15 years and, and longer. And uh, it's, I think that the work that is happening at City Hall, the work that is happening um, through Dan and others in this room, it, it's really fantastic and I, I look forward to over the course of the year, um, reflecting on some of those goals, where we are uh, a decade and a half later, and how can we not just um, reaffirm what those goals are, but make sense of what's the best data to actually measure our progress. Uh, we have access to things that we just never could have dreamed of um, that can help us better understand issues of neighborhood ch change. Uh, how do we measure social capital? How do we measure um, access to diverse amenities that support upward mobility and opportunity for communities? Uh, and so it's an exciting time to be a part of this ecosystem. And look forward to defining it and uh, working in it and doing things with it going forward. All right, so I'm a pacer when I speak, so I'm going to actually jump out of the chair for a few minutes. I'll, I'll sit back down when we have the conversation, obviously. Um, but I want to kind of uh, bring in the science angle here, right, and kind of try to answer the question, how do scientists contribute to this uh, ecosystem of, you know, uh, city, of nonprofit, of academic, especially here in Boston where we have so much, um, so much strength in that particular sector. And so I want to kind of pose that with a particular project that we've worked on and then try to expand that out to, to think about what the further implications are. So this is, this is actually just a quick cut out of a video of all of the um, 311, all of the CRM calls, calls for non-emergency government services in Boston over the course of a year. Um, and so even just this one cut, which covers probably a few days in the year, you get this beautiful kind of splash of color across the screen, right? They're, they're color coded by what the problem is, be it a pothole, a street light outage, a general request, uh, a broken sidewalk, so on and so forth. And it, it's so rich, right? There's so much information there. But yet, and when I show this to my students, I like to ask them, well, what did you learn? Mm -hmm. 
right? And you look at that and you kind of say, well, I know that people can't actually map calls to the middle of Franklin Park. That's what I learned here, right? I also learned the same thing about the airport, and I learned that people call pretty much all over the city. But other than that, what did you really get out of this, right? And the answer is it's not entirely clear, right? Because this is an operational data set, right? It was created for a particular purpose, which is to collect needs and to feed them back out to the necessary department or the appropriate department and to have those needs fulfilled. It was not made for knowledge necessarily. It was not made for research or for just extracting intelligence for the purpose of policy apart from running that operational system. So then the challenge is, well, how do we how do we extract the deep knowledge that is here, right? Because there's so much there. So how do you do that? And that, to me, is a real research question, and it's a brand new one, because we've never had this problem before. It's something for which we need to develop new methodologies and new approaches to solving. So we took this data set. Um, there's about, oh, unfortunately, that color doesn't show up too well. Um, we, we basically took this data set, which was 365,000 calls over two years, and we asked ourselves, well, if this were a research data set, what is missing, right? What don't we see here? And the first thing is content, right? That, that mess that you saw covers all sorts of different content, all sorts of different uh, types of events. And it's not clear that they're all reflecting one thing, right? One entity or dimension that you really want to understand about the city. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what information do I really want to know from this data set? Um, the second one is validity. Do the cases measure real conditions? You can imagine with this sort of system, you don't necessarily know if you're measuring lots of problems or if you're measuring lots of people who like to call about problems, what one might less politely call complainers. Um, you know, so you need to deal with that issue. And the third one, and the one I'm going to talk the least about, is reliability. This is a very kind of scientific concern, but it's an important one nonetheless is, how can you, what can you actually measure? Can you measure a census block group, a census tract? Can you measure one of the BRA's planning districts? Can you measure every six months? Can you measure every year? And that's actually really critical questions so that you avoid yourself getting into issues of, well, if I'm measuring daily, do I suddenly freak out because there were three calls in one day and that's 300% more than usual? And you know, then, then that gets to be trickier. And so you need to deal with those issues as well. Um, so what did we do, right? So the first thing we said was, is there an opportunity here to measure broken windows, right? The classic urban measure of physical disorder. Can we actually use these calls about deterioration and denigration in the public space and, and track them over time? So what we had to do was then isolate that down. It turns out only about one sixth of the case types that the city deals with actually fit that definition. And so you had to sort of isolate those and throw out all the rest. Validity, we actually had to go measure the civic response rate. Given a streetlight outage, what's the likelihood it's going to get called in at that spot? So we actually went out into neighborhoods, identified streetlight outages, and figured out how long it took each neighborhood to call in problems there in order to develop um, a fuller algorithm that could then use the system to track that response rate, uh, which was something that we developed on the back end. And then reliability, we assessed different time windows and different geographical um, spaces. So then we basically were able to make a consistent and re-measurable version of physical disorder for the city. And it looks something like this, right? So this is a measure that we call private neglect. So it actually broke into two pieces, and private neglect is housing issues, so things about pests, failing utilities, um, uncivil use of space, which is things like illegal rooming, um, parking illegally on one's front or backyards, um, and also problems with big buildings, apartment buildings and uh, condos. And so essentially we took all of this information, right, 19 case types, and we were able to isolate it into a dimension that was really informative and important to understanding the diversity of the urban landscape, right? What does Boston look like uh, at a given moment and what do its neighborhoods feel like? Um, the second one was public denigration. Um, so basically five different items dealing with trash and the inappropriate disposal of trash. And then two items dealing with graffiti, or mentioning graffiti. And so bringing those together into its own measure of what it feels like to be in one of these neighborhoods. What are the conditions? What are the events that occur there? What are the patterns? And being able to extract that uh, regularly. Um, so basically, what did we end up with? We ended up with a comprehensive measure of a single aspect of a neighborhood, right? And, and I point this out that it's comprehensive because there's a habit sometimes with these sorts of data to cherry pick one's favorite issue, right? The one that's on the front of the policy concern. 
oftentimes shootings, but also broken windows became an iconic thing, right, in the 80s. And so do you focus on just that one thing, or do you try to figure out what's the, what's the bigger picture here? What is this a part of, and can we access this broader pattern of, so in this case it turned out to be all different types of housing issues, and the ways people take care of private spaces became one kind of unitary feature of a neighborhood and, and how it relates to other neighborhoods across the city. Um, now, on the research side, what was really special here was we ended up with a multi-dimensional measure, right? There are five lower order, but as I showed you, two higher order measures. Um, researchers have been studying physical disorder for 150 years, and it's always been measured as one thing, physical disorder. But with the richness of these data, we were able to develop a more sophisticated measure uh, than anyone's ever done before. Now, to top it off, those old versions of doing this cost hundreds of thousands of dollars because you have to go out and survey an entire city. This is nearly costless. Now, it took a long time to develop the measure itself, but at this point, someone sends me the new data and we can run the analysis and develop the measures for the last year in a matter of about half an hour. Right? And it's continuous across time and space. You can actually measure it every two to six months uh, reasonably reliably. So if you really need to know what was happening in a place for a, a relatively small period of time, you can do that. So now one thing to kind of wrap this up uh, is, right, in this process, we wanted to measure physical disorder, but in the process, we had to figure out where people were using the system. And this gave us this new um, measure that we didn't even anticipate measuring, which was engagement, right? Where do people actually use this? And this is something no one's ever been able to measure before because it wasn't available, right? Without this system, it didn't exist. And even further, we developed this measure called custodianship, right? So areas that are darker green are areas where if a street light were to go out, you would be more likely to have someone come along and call it in. Right? And so these are measures that are really important in the sense of understanding how a neighborhood cares about itself and advocates for itself. Um, never could have been measured before this data set became available. And so it's a really great example of how some of these new systems are unlocking information we've never had access to before. Um, so then, just to kind of wrap up and suggest where do we go with this, right? So we have the methodology, now how do we implement it, right? I suggested how the scientists can do something with these data, but then how do we, how do we deliver? You know, and how do we become a partner in this process? One is an extended library of ecometrics. I've gone over my time, so I'm just going to skip over that, but I've had students working on different projects with 911, building permits, business licenses, restaurant inspections, Arts Boston's events calendar, so various things to measure the dimensions of the city. Um, Interpreting microspatial patterns, right? Once you have a concept of what your dimension is, you can actually look with these data at how every house and every street is contributing to that neighborhood context. This is a map of Bowdoin, Geneva, and um, issues of private neglect there over a two-year period. And you notice that for a neighborhood that is quote-unquote blighted, there's a grand variation in terms of how different houses and streets are contributing to that um, condition. Um, assessing neighborhood interventions. You have basically before and after data constantly being collected, right? You always know what's going on. And so if you do a neighborhood intervention um, at the policy level, you can then actually see what did the world look like before and what did the world look like afterwards. Um, and last but not least, certainly not least, sharing measures with community stakeholders. Um, how do you then bring this out to the public? And we have a public mapping platform at Bari called uh, Boston Research Map that we try to make these things available through once we are certain that the measure itself is valid and defensible uh, in some robust manner. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it over. So I wanted to actually um, just kind of point out what, what's interesting about this panel. I mean, we have a um, representative from government and, and, a, and a funder in the room and, and university. Um, and, and all of you have very different aims uh, with this data, I would say. Um, you know, Yasha, you're, you're exploring this in terms of uh, using the data to, to maximize efficiency, um, to make better, uh, better uh, sort of pathways to decisions. Uh, and Jessica, you're, you're, you know, a lot of what you're concerned about is that access question, is, is making sure that the resources are in place for the, for the proper sharing. And, um, and Dan, um, you know, of course, you're, you're looking at kind of basic research questions. So here's my question to you. Um, all of you have different motivations in, into, this, into this data. And I'm wondering when we think about, when you think about the ecosystem of, of Boston and, it, and its data, uh, and also an ecosystem that is 
that is uh, growing exponentially in the sense that there are more things that are producing data, more things that are measurable. Um, my question for you is, who's responsible for, for this? Uh, where in, in this ecosystem, with each of you with, with different motivations, different uses of this data, is there a responsible party? Is there, does there need to be, or does the ecosystem somehow balance itself? Um, what, are, what are the ways that we can get to a balanced ecosystem? Hmm. So uh, I'll throw in on that. I, you know, I think that the, the, to me the very nature of an ecosystem is one in which there is no one single responsible party who's controlling information or controlling resources. I think the challenge that we have, because we do have such, in some ways, a very robust ecosystem where we have a lot of, uh, we, ha we have a lot of people who are working with data, we have a lot of sources of data, and both of those things are growing, is how do we build connective tissue within this ecosystem? I may have a set of data that would be immensely valuable to a researcher, but if it isn't up on our open data portal or it isn't easy to find, they may not even know to ask that I have that data. There may be somebody out there who has spent the last three years building a incredibly useful uh, metric for something that we're trying to track against a policy uh, intervention, and we don't know that it exists or we don't have a way to get to it, and so we can't integrate that into our thinking and our management and our operation. So I think, to, to me, the, the goal for all of us in this room, and I, and I don't think it can ever be a single party, is less focused on, hey, we need to get to this specific outcome or we need to get here, but rather it's, it's how do we, what are the connectors, uh, whether it's you know, making it easier to find information, making it easier to find people, uh, understanding even who's looking at what and who cares about what to be able to, to know where to start a conversation. Those are the kinds of resources that I think will help strengthen this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think too, uh, last week had a, re a conversation with a few folks who were actually in this room about, you know, why ecosystem? Why are we calling it that? Is it infrastructure? Is it a landscape? Is it a network? And I think what we kind of came up with is that like there is some value in calling it an ecosystem because it can constantly and very agilely evolve into what it needs to be and not, if you have an infrastructure, you look around, it's something that's pretty built and fixed and you build a roadway, you build a house, it's probably sticking around for a while and might out, outlive its, its use or, or role and, and something else crops up and you can't quickly adapt to what it needs to be. And so I agree, I think that having, there's something around that connective tissue and making sure that, that the right information or the right elements of the ecosystem or whatever it is can get to the necessary consumers or or audiences or stakeholders, but um, that really the idea that it's a living, breathing, kind of dynamic thing that should have some kind of shape to it, but can, can very quickly and easily evolve. Um, and that, in, that kind of takes curation and kind of care from a lot of different entities, so. Um, so I think it's a, Eric, that's a very provocative question. Uh, and, My job. And <laughs> apparently, you're doing it well. Um, and so, I mean, thinking about it, right, and I, I guess I want to borrow Jessica's idea of ecosystem 2.0, right, and, and Yasha's idea of connective tissue, right, I think right now we're in the process of building ecosystem 2.0, and, and the nature of that is this sort of connective tissue, or I guess, so, you know, an ecosystem, we, we are mixing every biological metaphor we possibly can <laughs> on this panel, um, but I, I think of it in terms of resource flows, uh, you know, and so the data and the information arising from the data and then the, the interpretation and the, the dissemination of that information, those are kind of flows of the resource through, through the system, right? And we haven't necessarily built all of, the, all of those pipelines, right? We haven't necessarily built all those handoffs in order to have that information, that knowledge and intelligence flow through the system yet. And I think we're in that process right now. And what I think is fascinating and, and, and beautiful about, about something like this is that we're all incentivized to be doing so at the moment. So I think, Eric, your question of who governs isn't as important quite yet because we're all trying to figure it out together, right? We all need the generalized, I don't want to use the word infrastructure necessarily, but we all need Th those those pass offs. We all need those relationships if this is going to work at all. So right now there's kind of this mutual collaborative spirit to it. But I think as we get to ecosystem 3.0 and that sort of builds itself, yeah, of course we're going to get to a moment where there are 
uh, opportunities for people to, uh, you know, shirk their duties, as it were, or to overassume their their influence um, or ability to to work only for their own goals and not be collaborative. And it's an interesting question. I don't know what that institution looks like uh, that that starts to govern and and adjudicate the, those disagreements, but. It, it's a fascinating question, and in some ways I'm glad I don't think we have to deal with it quite yet, because uh, it, it doesn't sound as much fun to me, um, <laughs> but, but I think it's, it's somewhere on the horizon. Why, why should I not be scared of all of this? And, and, I, and I say that in the context of, um, uh, you know, it, fr from everything from, from the NSA to Uber, Right? I mean, we're, we're, in a, we're, we're having lots of national and international conversations about data and privacy um, and, and uh, you know, essentially responsibility uh, as, it, as it pertains to this growing amount of data about every person. So you know, I, I wonder, as, as, we, as we think about this in terms of an ecosystem and we celebrate the amount of data and the ability to know so much about people, um, you know, what, what protections are in place for the, for the citizen of Boston, essentially? Um, or what rights do they have uh, to their own data, and, and should they be concerned? Or, or should we just believe in the, in the good faith efforts of government and funders and universities? You know, and, and this is where I think that, you know, a lot of times I keep finding that these conversations all devolve into some of the real like granular sausage making. You, people start talking about tech and methodology and math and, and all of that. And fundamentally, I think that when the Indicators project started a long time ago, it was before like these buzz, buzzwords of open data. But we really, it, people talked about it in terms of democratized data. And really, just because something's open doesn't mean that regular people can use it. And mm -hmm. what we're talking about, our common, the thing that holds us together here is like, we're talking about Boston. And it's a community, and it's the people that we're serving. It's not, I mean, and it is kind of about like the cool things that we learn and the, the new things that we can do and um, findings that we can gather through data. But ultimately, ultimately it's about, you know, how well are people doing here? And mm. there's, I, I don't know, I think there's some element to of making sure that, that the community is engaged in this and is also finding it accessible and informative and useful in their lives. And, and that's something that we've tried to work on quite a bit over time um, with various partners here in the room, not just on research and, and policy, but in practice too. Like every two years we've done um, something called Data Day with Northeastern and a bunch of folks uh, to really get do some hands-on training and engagement around data. And kind of having that that um, element, I think, of, of accountability to, to making sure people know how it's used and why it's worth it for them to, to want to be a part of it. Yeah. I think that's great. And, I, and I'd, I'd, I'd add, I mean, we have work to do in this space, mm -hmm. right? We, uh, when we look at our legal framework uh, that exists around privacy, whether we're talking about governmental data, whether we're talking about private industry data, um, we as a country, as a state, as a city have work to do to build some of the protections and some of the legal infrastructure that we need. I mean, one very uh, specific example that we've encountered, we have a set of data that we, uh, is not personally identifiable by the definition that the Massachusetts statutes create for personally identifiable information. But we think that if it were to be used in conjunction with another data set that it could be de-anonymized. And now I look at that data and I say, I would not want to release that in a public records request because I believe that's private data. I'm not sure that I could legally do that. Um, we'd have to take it to the inspector general and get an opinion. So there are, there are places where our statutes have not cut up to the reality of the technology environment and the data environment in which we live in. The other piece I'd say is that this, is, this should be part of the ecosystem that we're building is some of the um, the, the, the point to point or peer to peer uh, governance structures that can exist around data. Uh, right now, if I want to share data with a, that, that, that may have some sensitivity to it with a researcher, uh, I need to go and put in place a MOU. Lawyers have to get involved. It's a long, complicated process. The department that uh, originated the data may not be interested in participating. It's a very high overhead uh, kind of engagement. Uh, what I would love to see as our ecosystem evolves is a more standardized framework come into being around some of the data governance and around the agreements that, that support sharing. You know, thinking about what's the Creative Commons equivalent of data exchange that allows us to know that certain things need protection to establish 
a categorization for them, but also to have an established and agreed legal framework by which we can do uh, exchanges and sharing and research and uh, aggregations that uh, actually protect the rights and, and, and needs of, uh, of consumers. So, I mean, I think that there is certainly a lot of awareness and a lot of uh, good intentions that exist, and, and that is a, a, a critically important first step, but we've got to build the legal and cultural frameworks around this. Um, is, is it is it it's interesting, um, I wonder if it's important that the, the, one of the, the pieces of the ecosystem that's not represented on this panel is the private sector. So, and, and isn't most of our data uh, held in the private sector? So, it, how, what, what do you say about that? I mean, should we be involving um, you know, Google and Facebook and Uber uh, in, in all of these conversations? How should we deal with it? That's a tough question, right? And um, I think there's, there's something to be said it's kind of funny how the, the three kind of sectors that we have represented up here, um, we have a certain obligation, uh, either in practice or in theory, to the public. Uh, probably um, my sector the most in theory, uh, but but you know, it, just in the sense that we're not we're not technically or institutionally beholden to the public, but we but we like to believe that we are, uh, and I think that's in part why um, people like myself and and my colleagues who are involved with Bari and other you know, entities of the sort, we're interested in bringing our information out, you know, and getting into the public. Uh, I don't know, you know, for, for private uh, corporations, there are different incentives, right? And we were talking a little bit about how, how do we fit together the, the, the different sectors based on their incentives and make them, um, you know, conversant with one another. And I think there are some interesting different incentives there uh, around all these things, right? The, the privacy issue, you know, in some ways, those companies have data that are way more pr private and personal than anything that any of us have access to. And so that becomes a very interesting question, what they could, what sort of agreements and exchanges they could even enter into, you know? And so that, I think that brings up a very important and dangerous or challenging question for them. Um, and I think also that, that other side of uh, how do you then, and are they incentivized to translate that information to the public the way, you know, Jessica was talking about making it available through the Boston Indicators, or I, I know um, Michael Johnson and Mark Warren are here from Urban Boston, you know, thinking about how to get that information into forms and formats that a community group, you know, a Dudley Square Neighborhood Initiative or, you know, Viet Aid down in Dorchester could access, you know, 311 data, right, the kinds of things that I'm doing, but look at it for their neighborhood, right, their, their geographic, the region that they advocate for. Um, and I, I guess it's an interesting question. How does the private sector think about those? Uh, do they think about them as obligations or as um, bonuses to their work? Um, and do they, do they think that their data are appropriate to be even used in those sorts of ways? Speaking of the public, maybe we should open it up um, to, uh, to this public here. Are, are there any questions, either physically or virtually, uh, that people want to ask? Uh, do, do we need to go to the mic? Yeah. yeah. So if you can please stand up, and the mic's right behind you. Sir. Hi, Rick Pizer at Harvard Design School. I have a question for accessing the data that the city's putting together for uh, student and faculty research purposes. Um, is there any mechanism, I assume you're setting it up to be queried by the public for the most part, but if we want batch data, <laughs> uh, is there any way to facilitate that? Uh, when I've done this before, dealing with government, it's usually taken uh, at least a semester, so the people wanting to work on it will have long gone. <laughs> Fair enough. So sometimes uh, the academic world moves faster than city government, uh, not the other <laughs> way around. Yeah. Um, so we are trying to make uh, our data available in ways that are uh, more real time and more uh, useful. I think w when we look at our existing open data portal, if you go to data.cityofboston.gov, you can see all the data sets that we currently make available to the public. And many of them are actually updated on a, typically on a nightly basis. So they are near real time uh, and, uh, and, and quite up to date. There are other data sets, however, that are, were uploaded once three years ago and nobody's bothered to refresh them. Uh, we're trying to do a few things. I mean, one is certainly to look at making more data available in that near real-time context. But the other is to do a better job of telling you what we have and what it is, to catalog. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges that we see in the world of uh, open data is that it's often looked at as 
Uh, okay, well, the data is up there, so I'm sure somebody will find it, figure out what it means, and figure out how to make it useful. Uh, and there's often a bit of a gap to be able to look at a data set and even know how often is this updated, how reliable is it, where did it come from, who do I contact if I have issues about it. We haven't done uh, our work to really build uh, these data sets into real knowledge resources. So that's another area that we're trying to invest in in the city to try to make things that are more useful for you. Hi, I'm Saul Tannenbaum from Cambridge, and um, I'd like to explore the private sector issue a little bit more um, with a specific example, Bridge. Um, if you don't know, Bridge is a pop-up transportation company that wants to use big data to decide where to run little buses you know, on demand. Um, and when they came to Cambridge, um, Cambridge was concerned about um, overcrowded bus stops and not having bridge not get in the way of you know the MBTA and other shuttle buses etc um, and as they were exploring ways to do that um, you know bridge offered their real-time data on their buses which you know is a great sort of thing but Cambridge's reaction as it was described to me was just whoa um, you know because you know the city and I think this would probably be true of any city is simply not prepared to ingest that sort of data and do regulation from it. Um, and that talks to a, you know, a sort of another issue um, you know, in terms of the private sector that their tools are at this point way more powerful than the tools in the public sector. Um, you know, once I heard the bridge example, you know, it, you know, the, the, the first thing that popped into my mind is that this is what 21st century regulation is going to look like. So my, my question is, you know, as the data system, you know, data ecosystem evolves, how do cities get there? Do you mind if I, yeah, and, and then it. you can yeah. jump on. Um, so I think, I, I think the issue here is one of, it's kind of two pronged, right? It's capacity as well as um, culture. You know, and, and so, and the two kind of go together, right? And so one way that I think we've created a lot of our collaborations is, you know, uh, especially in the early days of Bari, we were saying use academia as your R&D team. You know, so that would be a, a perfect example of a case where I might say, you know, Bridge offered you this opportunity that you really don't have the internal capacity to handle and it's, you know, completely understandable from where municipal government stands at the current moment. Find an academic partner. Let us help you find an academic partner who will help you build out the information and the, the system that you need to then implement this. Um, now, I, do I think that's forever? No, I think there's an opportunity, though, for culture change. So this seems as good of a moment as any to plug. Uh, Northeastern has a master's in urban informatics starting next year. You know, and this is, <laughs> I apologize. It's, it's as shameless as it gets. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> You're doing that in the public interest. <laughs> yes, it, thank you, Saul. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, you know, those sorts of things are popping up across the country, right? There's, there's one at NYU. There's a similar program, University of Chicago. And it's in a public policy school, at least in this case, right? So then you start training the policymakers and practitioners of the next generation with these skills, you know, data mining skills, visualization skills. Uh, database management skills, and then so I think you're exactly right. It's the regulation of the 21st century, and we're only in 2014. You know, I think give it give it five, six, seven years. I think those sorts of capacities will be endemic to municipal governments, and and it, it, again, it actually takes a different type of collaboration, but continued collaboration between uh, higher education and uh, the municipal sector. Yeah, I think there's there's huge benefit in that. And, you know, I would say, I mean, in Boston, like, we are ready for a lot of that data. Are we going to be able to make you know, a perfect use of it? No, not necessarily. But understanding, you know, we're looking at real-time GPS, and not real-time, but uh, historic GPS data from taxi cabs and talking with companies like Uber and Lyft to try to understand transportation patterns and issues of transit equity as we think about what the right regulatory model could look like for some of the more innovative forms of transportation. You know, we're doing partnerships. Uh, we're starting a partnership 
partnership with Waze around uh, sharing data with them to better inform our traffic management program. I mean, the private sector is an incredible rich source of information that uh, can help us govern better and can help us operate better. And there is a partnership that needs to exist there. So we're eager to explore those. I mean, there are policy questions embedded in a lot of these things that will take time to sort through. I think Boston has taken a, a generally progressive stance as long as you're not trying to sell public parking spaces. Uh, we are uh, really happy to talk to you and happy to try to engage and support you. Um, but I think you know, we're, we're, we're eager to see that, that data partnership thrive as well. And I'll also say too, just the reality of the ecosystem and what's there, there are a number of people who I could point to in this room right here um, who are existing resources, who can help cities, who are helping cities do that. I know uh, Bill Oates having been at the city of Boston, now at the state, uh, the Dukakis Center, uh, my partner Holly St. Clair from MAPC in the back, Harlan from Code for Boston. There are people who are have skills and capacity and, and I think that that's where this 2.0 element is coming into play, that there are, Different kinds of entities that can help cities um, and and non cities, uh, you know, nonprofits, foundations, uh, kind of start to harness this data in a way that makes sense. So. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if, if, speaking of Bill Oates, I wonder if it makes sense, Bill. Can I call on you and see if you have anything to add to this from the from the perspective of the state? <laughs> <laughs> There's a microphone right here. Well, that's, you're you're good. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, so again, I've I had a ton of experience with a lot of the folks up here uh, at the city, uh, and it's great to hear what Yash is doing in terms of taking that to the next level in terms of the city's ability to respond to this. Uh, but I do think that uh, you know one of the reasons that I'm here and a, a chunk of our our folks from uh, Mass IT at the Commonwealth is to really think about this capacity building. I mean, we have such an opportunity uh, with the ecosystem that has been referenced earlier to really do great things and to make better decisions and to share data more effectively across the, uh, across the Commonwealth and, and the region. Uh, so, you know, this, we have to think about, you know, the blocking and tackling that exists in some of these big organizations that can provide the data and provide the support. Uh, when I, every time I see Dan talk about uh, the 311 data from the city of Boston and the kind of uh, uh, analysis he's been able to do in that, I think back on how important it was to put a system in that actually gathered that data, you know, and then to build mobile apps on top of it so that we could increase, you know, the amount of data that we had available to us. And I think we have those kinds of opportunities all over the place and, and still, I think, as you all said, lots more work that needs to be done, whether it's the, the legal side of it to help with the data sharing, the privacy aspects of it, uh, but also kind of that core connectivity that we need to build uh, so that we can connect the dots across the ecosystem. So, so we're here because we think that the Commonwealth uh, can do a better job of being an enabler of uh, unlocking that important data. And, it, and sometimes it's technically uh, has to be unlocked. Sometimes it's culturally it has to be unlocked. But we have such a, an upside to do this that, you know, it's just great to listen to this dialogue because I think we all understand that. And it's really down to, you know, getting the work done, building the capacity, and connecting the dots everybody's explained here. So this is great. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. Yeah, um, I'm Michael Johnson, University of Massachusetts, Boston, and thank you, Dan, for mentioning the Urban Boston Initiative with Mark Warren. Um, I'd like to know what we know about the demand for the kinds of data you're describing um, across our neighborhoods, which are diverse in so many ways, and if we have any special insight into the data needs of our um, most uh, distressed and disadvantaged neighborhoods. You know, I don't think we do, and I think that's a problem. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen, the UN recently released a report kind of on, on the data revolution and sustainability and kind of a, um, findings of a year, lo lots of discussions, but they started talking about places that are data rich and data poor, and that's a critical element to really solving these problems. So if we wanna tackle poverty, if we want to, you know, in Boston, increase educational attainment, if, if we don't know, if we still don't have the information that we need to know whether we're doing a good job, um, that's, a, that's a critical infrastructure issue just as much as having bad roads and having poor schools. Um, and so I, I really, that's something that I think uh, with the 
Boston Indicators Project. You know, we've had opportunities to do convenings with folks, trainings with folks over the, the time that we've been in, um, around. But that those feedback loops, those real honest feedback loops and making sure that the information we're putting out there is meeting the needs of a really diverse set of, of players um, and decision makers and stakeholders that I don't think we have those good feedback loops yet. I mean, I think there needs to be a, a significant amount of attention put to uh, the capacity of, of communities and community organizations to, to, to use the data effectively. Uh, and you know, my own research, I mentioned earlier on um, that I was interested in this life cycle. And, and I think this is part of the life cycle of data that we have to actually talk about the end user um, <clears throat> and, and the, various, um, the, the, the various guises that the, the end user takes, um, the capacity in which people, um, that, that people bring uh, to data, and then ultimately the meaning that comes out of it. And, and I mentioned small data. I'm, I, actually, what I meant by that was um, was that the, the kind of meaning that derives from data. And it was actually from our earlier conversation that we had over the phone, uh, we talked a lot about data as being a, a, a conversation starter. You know, so it answers questions, but it also opens up questions. And I think that's a really important thing to consider. So as we, as we understand where this data goes, working with, computer, uh, working with communities and then understanding the experiential aspects of data, I think needs to be at the table, um, so not just access, but but use. Um, you know, earlier, and, and also, I, I'm disappointed that we didn't get to our more philosophical issue about whether it's data or data. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think with that, we, we we do have to we do have to end. So thank you very much for. Thank you.